Green is the color of nature, reflecting the many nuances of vegetation and a symbol of life itself. Green, like the Ifran forest, the most beautiful cedar forest in Morocco, where Barbary macaques live in total liberty. I love the serenity which reigns in this forest. When I'm not in my shop, because there are no customers, I spend most of my time in this forest. I often wander beneath the giant cedars. I feel a great inner peace. It regenerates me. I find it impossible to imagine living without this forest. With the first rays of sunlight, the macaques come down from their trees and spread out in the clearings to warm up. And every day from springtime onwards, Mohammed comes to visit them. The macaque is almost as intelligent as man. It understands things very quickly. If it wants to get something, it acts like a human being. They seize a moment of your inattention to grab what they want, especially if it's food. Then it carries away its prize and seeks refuge in the treetops and starts to eat whilst observing you. Sometimes they steal things thinking it might be food, and when they realize they've made a mistake, they start playing with it and end up throwing it back at us. These playful, gentle macaques are the soul of the Ifran forest. They are usually wild, but certain groups have learned to live alongside man. The Barbary macaques are the main tourist attraction in the forest, and they draw quite a crowd. People come from throughout the Kingdom of Morocco and beyond to hear the human mimicry of these primates as they beg for food. The natural habitat of these macaques of the Atlas Mountains is coveted for other uses. The Ifran forest is also home to vast flocks of sheep who come to graze here. Without meaning to, the shepherds are continually pushing the macaques back to the edge of the forest. Besides the sheep, commercial exploitation of the cedar, a valuable wood, is reducing the monkey's territory yet further. To meet the country's demand for wood, thousands of trees are cut down every year in the Middle Atlas region. In the space of a few decades, man and machines have driven out the last wild animals from this forest. 
Until the end of the 1960s, there were lions and tigers here. Their lairs were just over there, where those shacks are. They were also found in the region of Sidi Mer, in the high atlas at Tunfit. But since the cedar has been exploited at this rate, the noise generated by our activity has driven out these animals. Before, it was very dangerous to venture into this forest. There were many wild animals, like hyenas, wolves and foxes. All those animals used to live here, but they've gradually disappeared. In the Ifran forest, there are still some protected areas for the Barbary macaque. But the last macaques of the atlas still living in a natural environment are quite simply dying out. And with them, the symbol of this forest. To the south of Fez, the 116,000 hectares of the Ifran National Park formed the green lung of Morocco. Green also means the astonishing miracle of water in a land where a third of the territory is covered with arid deserts and where rains are rare. South of Wazazat, the most wonderful palm groves in the kingdom are to be found. They extend their luxuriant fronds in a long green ribbon for some 200 kilometers in an ochre and brown valley, the Dra Valley. In this valley, two million date palms tower over the other crops. Beneath their fronds, these plants hide their golden fruit, which was once the staple food of the nomads and which features in every ritual in Moroccan life. Everyone here lives from the palm trees. People make a bit of money from them. Some make a good living out of it, but not many. There are specialists who climb in the trees. They make the dates fall onto a tarpaulin at the base of the tree. We start to sort the fallen dates on the tarpaulin or alongside. Then we put them in boxes, put them on the back of a donkey and take them home. We eat the good dates or sell them and the bad ones go to the animals. There are loads of dates here, and most of the people live from this fruit. Folk come from Agadir to load up their Peugeots and resell them. In Zagora, the palm grove is a hive of activity from early morning. There is no time to waste because the plants all need to be tended. Like the henna, a tricky shrub to grow and one which requires a great deal of attention. Henna is cultivated on small areas and is harvested two or three times a year before being dried in the shade. At Tinzelin in the Dra Valley, the Al Wafa Women's Cooperative produces natural henna from these dried leaves. Around 30 women come to work here every day. 
Fatima, Jamila, Lubna, Najat and the others transform this plant reputed for its many virtues. This cooperative owes its existence to the tenacity of its boss, Aisha, operating in a society where it is mainly men who make the decisions. We buy dried leaves and we grind them into a powder. Henna is green when it is fresh, and it leaves a lovely red colour on the skin. As the henna ages, it becomes ochre on the hands. The more time goes by, the darker and more beautiful it becomes. I mix henna with water, then put it on my hands and also on my head. We brush our hair and then wash it. But henna is mainly for parties. Henna is no ordinary plant. In the Muslim religion, it is one of the trees of paradise. For these women, with their attachment to traditional beliefs, henna is the magic powder which protects them, helps them and fulfills their dreams. Henna has fascinated and enchanted all Moroccan society for centuries. Henna is very important for us. It protects us against lots of things. It takes away sadness. It brings joy. Henna is essential for us. Although their products are still not sold everywhere in Morocco, the women of Tinzulin are very attached to coming here. This cooperative is first and foremost a community where they gather away from the men. The Al Wafa Cooperative is a small community of women who happily lead their lives with henna. In the south of the Dra Valley, at Tamgrut, green is celebrated in another form. The reputation of these pottery workshops, the oldest in the country, is built on the green of this enamel. For more than 400 years, two families have shared the workshops and kilns. Here they make a typically rural kind of pottery. The green of Tamgrut is still made by hand, a legacy handed down over centuries, as Hamid explains. It's the legacy of our grandparents, and that's why we've kept this colouring for our pottery over time. Our aim is to always preserve the green pottery. If the novelist Pierre Loti, during his journey to Morocco in 1889, had come this way, he would certainly have seen these same ancient kilns in the shape of cupolas. He would have written about these ovens belching out black smoke, perhaps reminding him of the bonfires of Benares in India. The green enamel of Tamgrut really comes into being in these clay ovens, heated for five hours with palm wood and dry brush until they reach 1,100 degrees centigrade. The secret of the green lies in firing an enamel made of silica, manganese, copper oxide and barley flour. There are plates, jars, salad bowls, all types of bowls, candle holders, ashtrays. We've also kept the big mixing bowls because they are products which are generally used down in the southern region. Green is the color of nature. 
It's also the color of peace in Islam and of religion. It's the color that's used in the construction of mausoleums and mosques. In the Muslim world, green is primarily the color of Islam. The most worthy representation of this sacred color is the highest religious building in the world, the famous Hassan II Mosque, built partly over the sea in Casablanca. This is the monument of the century, the dream of a nation, fulfilled by the will of its king, the commander of the faithful, the late Hassan II, who built here one of the world's most amazing mosques. After seven years of construction, a masterpiece of monumental art and Arab Muslim architecture rose from the land and sea. The king wanted a work of excess and the best craftsmen in the kingdom toiled on this colossus of marble, granite and stucco. The guides reel off its impressive dimensions. The mosque is considered one of the biggest mosques in the world. It covers a total area of nine hectares, seven here on the outside and two inside in the prayer room. It has a capacity of 105,000 people, 25,000 in the prayer room, including 5,000 women in the two mezzanines that we see up there. The architecture is the Moorish style, which is widespread across North Africa and also in Spain. One can see it in the cupolas there, made of cedar, which is Moroccan cedar carved by hand, painted by hand, and the paint is also made in the traditional way from natural products. At a height of 60 meters, the heavy ceiling opens to allow the light in. The place of worship uses technology, since only machines can move such weights and such dimensions. The light finally reveals calligraphy, giving the 99 names of Allah around the edge of the ceiling. The Hassan II Mosque has a dazzling wealth of decoration. People come from around the world to see this monumental art that aims to defy time. It's all so beautiful, and everything you see is a gift. All the artistic works that we see everywhere here make one think what humans are capable of, for the right cause, when one can use that gift to embellish our lives. To pray, women enter by a door at the back of the mosque and go to the mezzanines. The men pray below in the central nave.
I want to build here a beautiful house of God, a mosque whose minaret will announce the voice of salvation, the path of Allah to all ships coming from the West. These were the wishes of the king who built the great lighthouse of Casablanca. In the province of El Kalashragna, a story is told of a holy man who lived a life of wandering from village to village to found mosques and Sufi schools. As his last resting place, this saint lay in a tomb in a village, which four centuries later in the 1970s was covered by the waters behind a dam. In this province, peopled with peasants, shepherds and fishermen, the story of this saint did the rounds, each telling it his own way. They left the village of El Gaba and walked as far as a huge cave on the banks of a river. It was inhabited by lions and lionesses. The sheikh addressed the beasts. You have lived your time in this cave. Our time has come to live here. You must go. And the lions left. The man continued telling us this wonderful story, the hero of which is Saint Sidi Alal ben Enuiti. He spoke of a day when the heat was such that the man and his disciples decided to stop for a while in an absolutely deserted spot. When rested, the saint stood up and immediately a tree began to grow. And now, several centuries later, one of the finest olive trees in Morocco still grows here, in splendid isolation in this arid land. In this province, we are protected by our ancestors. If one of our cows falls sick, we slaughter it, and we can eat its meat without it making us sick. Likewise, we fear nothing from rabid dogs. When one of us is ill, we don't go to the doctor, but to our master, so that he cures us. This region is blessed with divine grace. In the 1990s, all the villagers recalled having the same dream. The saint came to ask them to build him a new tomb, so he could at last come and rest near them, and no longer near the dam. The men carried out this wish, disinterring his remains so he could now lie near the living, under this green cloth, a sign of saintliness. The women come to seek his blessing and support. In honor of this saint, the men don their ceremonial costumes to pay tribute to him. At the foot of the olive tree, the old storyteller adds that the most extraordinary part was when they dug up the saint in his old tomb, and four centuries after he died, his body was still in perfect condition. And thus, from the Ben Anuiti sepulchre, this saint watches over the villages, his memory enduring down the centuries.